This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Roots and All. My guest this week is Hilary Collins, who runs Hardy Eucalyptus at Grafton Nursery. Hilary Research is the best way to grow eucalyptus trees in the UK and also Europe. At the nursery, they run all manner of trials and Hilary writes papers and articles on eucalyptus. Plus, she has a book called Cut Foliage Eucalyptus, Fantastic Foliage and How to Farm It. She consults all over the world and also works in the garden design and construction company, advising on planting design. Hilary's here today talking all things eucalyptus. And my first question was how she came to specialise in this group of plants. So it's a very unglamorous answer, really. We bought this nursery, which laughably is the retirement project. So we bought this nursery in 2008. So coming to this fresh site, we thought, well, what shall we grow? And uh, Steve and my husband said, we well, grow whatever you like. So I had a look around a few different crops and we got friends who were growing herbaceous perennials, which I love. I thought, well, I don't want to set up in business in competition with them. So I started looking at bamboo. I found bamboo very badly behaved. And I looked at one or two other crops. And I'd grown eucalyptus in the past. And I thought, well, I'll get some seedlings off that guy in Wales up near Conway. And I'll get a few of those in and we'll have a little dabble with some eucalyptus trees, see how we get on. Only to discover that, very sadly, this chap was no longer on the planet. He died a couple of years earlier. And I thought, well, he must have found that there was a market for eucalyptus. What is it about eucalyptus? And I started researching eucalyptus and what they could do and how many there were. And I was just amazed to discover that there were a thousand variety species cultivars available. But there were at least 40, 50 that were hardy enough to grow outside in this country in most parts of the UK. And then there's another few where you have to be very blessed and perhaps living on the south coast to get away with growing them. And so I just started collecting them and growing them and giving it a go. And then we discovered that we had a whole range of customers, different types of customers like farmers and flower farmers and local authorities who were interested in them. And I was just hooked. That's how it started. Brilliant. You mentioned, obviously, you started your collection. How do you propagate a eucalyptus? Essentially, they are grown from seed. So we're very, very careful about where we buy our seed from. You can go online and just buy eucalyptus seed, but you've got no idea what the provenance is. And provenance is hugely important with eucalyptus, as it is with some other plant species. But with eucalyptus, you need to know that the seed has come from an area that is subject to really bad frosts or cold. So think Tasmania. Tasmania is very like Wales, I believe. I've not been there climate-wise. And very frosty valley bottoms or mountain tops where they have snow. So we ask for provenance where our seed is collected and we collect that and everything is catalogued. So there's a code that goes with every tree that we grow. So we know where the seed came from. But if you buy eucalyptus seed from somewhere warm in Australia, even though it's got gunny eye on the label, for example, it won't necessarily be hard enough to grow outside in this country in a bad winter. If you transported a penguin from South Pole to North Pole, for example, or you know that that penguin would survive because of the temperature it's used to. But if you took a penguin that was raised in a zoo, maybe in the south of France, for example, and then took it to one of the poles, it wouldn't be very happy and it probably wouldn't survive as well. Does that make sense? Yeah, perfect sense. So obviously it's going to differ from species to species, but are there any that are particularly hardy and what sort of minimum temperatures are we thinking about for them? So we talk about root hardiness because very often in very bad winters, we find that eucalyptus can be deciduous and they will drop their leaves because they're a liability. The leaves lose water. They've got, if you remember O-level biology, they're showing her age, you've got the stomata on the leaves that lose moisture. So that makes the leaf a liability. 
And uh, eucalyptus don't go fully dormant in a winter. So it's important. There's lots of other factors affecting this, but it's important that you get really, really hardy seed. And then within that, you look at varieties that will grow in your area. So if you grow in a garden in Northumberland, you're going to have a different take on which eucalyptus you're going to grow as opposed to somebody in sunny Cornwall. And so if you're in Northumberland or somewhere equally as cold and blustery in the winter, you want to head for things like the snow gums like the Beezyville, which um, it's a pousy flora group. A lot of eucalyptus are in groups. So the snow gum group, this pousy flora, subspecies to Beezyville, that's probably one of the hardiest, if not the hardiest eucalyptus. And its common name is the Junama snow gum. And that comes from snowy mountain tops. So even though if we had a minus 20 degree winter, even that might suffer. If it's an old mature plant, it would probably survive. A young plant would suffer more. An old plant has got collateral that will help it survive. And it will also have a deep and large root system. So that's why, again, it's very important to get eucalyptus deep rooted at the time of planting. There's also things like Gunnii group. Gunnii is the species type, but there's also Glaucessens and Archeri. Archeri is even hardier than Gunnii. It's Ernigera, the urn gum. That's in Gunnii group. That's pretty tough. Glaucessens comes with three different provenances. You've got Central Victoria, Guthiga, and also Tindery. And whilst Tindery is more pretty and being more silvery, Guthiga comes from a ski resort and is very, very hardy. You mentioned planting and deep rooting. So I've got a few questions out of that. Is there anything special we need to do when we plant them? And are they suitable for a range of soils? Yes. So eucalyptus are very site specific. I grow on an alkaline clay, yellow clay, which is quite swampy, even though we're on the side of a hill. It takes a long time to drain. So if I'm planting snow gums, I have to mound plant them so that they're not sitting in the cold, wet clay. Whereas I can grow a range of swamp gums and they absolutely love it because there's so much moisture. So choosing the right eucalyptus for your garden is very important. There's a series of questions I run through when I'm speaking to somebody who's interested in growing eucalyptus. And the first question is, what job do you want this eucalyptus to do? And very often they'll say, well, I want it for screening in my garden. Very often the urban customer will say, I've lost the trees at the end of my garden. and I've got a housing estate going in and I want an evergreen tree that is quick growing, but I don't want it to grow to 100 foot. So we'll say, OK, so what height do you want to maintain it at? or grow it too naturally. And they say, well, I can get the gardener in to prune it once a year, which is a different conversation altogether. So we say, right, so you need a screening tree. What part of the country are you in? So we find out what their geography is. We then ask them what their soil type is and how exposed or sheltered the garden is. And then we drill down into, well, let's say you've got normal garden soil, you're growing in the Midlands or London, and you want to grow an, a nice variety that you can keep as a screening tree. And you can do some pruning once a year, at which point we'll say, well, there's a range of eucalyptus you can look at. And then it's like choosing curtain fabric. You would suggest things like archery, parvula is a good one. You can look at some of the bigger ones if you're prepared to prune them like Glaucessens. But good screening trees, things like Neglecta, which has fantastic leaves the size of a, a, a tea plate, quite large in the juvenile phase. And then as it matures, it produces leaves that are a bit like bay leaf on steroids. And it flowers in August, which the bees love. It's very, very well behaved. It's fast growing, but it only gets to around about seven metres if you don't prune it. We prune ours, which sits outside our kitchen. Fabulous screening tree, and all the new growth is violet suffused with silver in July, August. It's quite an incredible plant. And in the winter, 
we get hundreds of goldfinches roosting in it overnight because all the hedges are bare. So all the goldfinches just mass in this neglector. We grow a particular selection called Dargo Plains, which has very nice form. So there's a number of trees that they can choose to do that job. Other people want it for cutting. Some people want to grow firewood logs. We have farmers who want to grow an evergreen tree in a boggy area. So they need a swamp gum. So there's a range of swamp gums that like growing in wet soils that dry out in the summer. Uh, But that also helps keep the water on the land and not let it run off, causing flooding problems further down. So they can do a number of jobs, but we like people to define what they're looking for first. And then when we know their growing environment, we suggest a range of trees that will be happy in that growing environment. It sounds super versatile. Obviously, you mentioned pruning. Well, I think they can be pollarded, can't they? A lot of people do that to get bigger leaves, probably for something like floristry or if if you want to reflect. Can they all be pruned? They can all be pruned, but timing is hugely important. So if I talk about planting first and then we look at pruning. So at the time of planting, it's important that your eucalyptus tree is air pot grown. We can talk about air pots in a minute, but the air pot grown eucalyptus is the only way forward to make sure that it doesn't fall over. Then you take that pot off at the time of planting. And what we want people to do is to, instead of digging a bomb crater, which they dig a very large, broad hole to plant an oak tree because it's come bare rooted. So you've got a hole that's something like a meter in diameter. We don't want that with the eucalyptus. We want quite a narrow hole that's probably only a couple of inches wider than the pot. But we do want them to dig a mine shaft. We want them to dig a hole twice the depth of the pot, particularly if they're on a clay soil. And we want to chuck all that soil under the hedge or wherever, because it's subsoil, and then fill the bottom half of the hole with a nice friable topsoil mixed with 10% sharp sand. And that's so that when you plonk the roots on top of it, the roots go, hey, this is really easy to go down. It's kind of tricky to go sideways, but it's really easy to go down. And you apply root grow mycorrhizal fungi because everybody uses that with all their tree planting. So that's good. But eucalyptus need that because they're very dependent on their root fungi to get food out of the garden soil. And we want them to go down deep, not only for stability but also in cold winters like this, where the top soil level has frozen. At about 18 inches down, it's a constant six degrees in lowland Britain. So there's always water available. And so your tree will be able to access moisture and won't get as badly scorched as if it was just shallow rooted in frozen soil. Pruning, pruning is hugely important. And we want people to prune really from the get go We have a tradition in this country of growing eucalyptus gunnii, which has given its entire family a bad name. And we plant this cute little blue bushy thing that was bought in a smooth walled pot that was bad anyway. And we plant it about two metres away from the conservatory. And we tend not to notice for a few years that this thing has grown to 30 foot. So the tree surgeon comes in and butchers it. And there's huge pruning wounds and it all looks horribly truncated. And they never really look nice after that. So what we like people to do is to prune their tree. If they're going to manage it and keep it small and not allow it to grow to full size naturally, if they want to manage it, then they need to look at it every March the 18th and go and assess how much it grew last summer and then realise that it's going to grow the same again this summer. So if they want to control it, they need to prune it sometime between the mid and the end of March. And if they're going to do pollarding for cut foliage or to keep it as a bushy shrub like a pittosporum or a shrub rose, and you're going to pollard it quite severely, then that needs to be done in March. If you're in the north of the country, you might consider doing it early April, because you have a a lower start to the growing season. But certainly at that part of the year, you would do serious pruning. And then you allow it to come into growth 
And then you can do tip pruning on the annual wood to control it again at the end of May. And a little bit maybe in June and certainly not after mid to end July. No pruning mid end to July through to the next March because you can get diseases getting into the wounds like silver leaf fungus. There's a, a number of fungi that will attack eucalyptus and they don't heal well when they're not actively growing. So if you want to kill a eucalyptus, prune it in November. Okay, noted. And so March the 18th, that's kind of a safe date, is it? It's, should everybody be ringing that in their calendar? It's National Eucalyptus Day UK. Oh. So, yeah, they have their own national day. In Australia, their National Eucalyptus Day is March the 23rd this year. And the Australians are really big on this. They go out and they have festivals and they celebrate their national tree and they have all sorts of activities. In this country, it'd be very nice if people go out and celebrate their eucalyptus trees. We do. But we want them to go out and look at their eucalyptus tree and think about what pruning they're going to do. And then when it's not frosty or rainy or snowy, end of March, go out and do that pruning with very, very clean pruning equipment. So either clean it with a horticultural sterilant or use vodka. But just make sure you've got no fungal spores on your pruning knives, pruning secateurs. Okay, good tip. My one question, I suppose, about eucalyptus is that there's a patch that I drive past often. And when we had this kind of winter and we had a little wind, there were some that had keeled over. And I think that goes back to what you were saying about the rooting. But are they short lived anyway? They're not short lived, although I'm going to say I think it's species specific. So some will be more long lived than others. So globulus in Tasmania, there are some huge, I think they're about 300, 200, 300 years old, but maybe the smaller varieties which might be shorter lived. So I think big species tend to be longer lived. Falling over, that's as a result of being grown in a smooth wall plant pot or having a destroyed root system because somebody's dug a trench or something and the tree's lopsided. More often than not, it's because the eucalypt has been grown in a smooth wall traditional plant pot. And it's a very fast growing hardwood. And as a consequence, when those roots hit the wall of the pot, they get pushed round in a spiral. And so what you're growing is hardwood spring like a corkscrew. And when you plant that, that never corrects itself. What it does is off the existing root system, it just produces a series of fine roots. And because it's hardwood, it can't undo that corkscrew. Now, so, oh, well, I'll spread out the roots at the time of planting. Well, that's a great way to kill a eucalyptus as well, because they're very, very root sensitive. And so the Australians had this problem Way back in the 1950s, they started growing container-grown trees, like we did in this country. And they grew a lot of eucalyptus in smooth walled pots, and they planted them in their high streets and their public open spaces. And 20 years later, these fast-growing hardwood trees were starting to fall over and squash things like cars and people. And quite rightly, the Australians got a bit miffed and said to their council, this isn't good enough, you've got to stop this from happening. And they spoke to a nurseryman. They said to this chap, please, can you help us stop our eucalyptus from falling over? And this guy produced what he called the rocket pot. That was the first iteration. And he brilliantly designed this pot, which is a black plant pot with straight sides and full of holes. And on the inside, it's full of cones. You can see them on our website. And the cones inside are very soft. And they guide the roots out through the holes where they get air pruned off very gently. And it engineers a root system that is like a baby's bottle brush. You've got like spokes of a wheel going off in every direction. And you take the plant pod off at the time of planting. You don't disturb the root system. You just put it gently in the ground. You pack it with root grow mycorrhizal fungi and backfill it with sandy soil. And that's it. The tree just takes off like a rocket. And they're produced in this country in Glasgow from recycled shampoo bottle tops. So the entire air pot is recyclable and it's made from recycled plastics. They sound ideal. You mentioned, obviously, that they are hardwood trees. 
And when we were arranging the interview, you sent over a few of the different things that they're used for, which is quite an array of uses that there is for eucalyptus. Can you just talk a little bit about what they might be used for, not necessarily in this country, but kind of worldwide? So there isn't a day that goes by when you don't come into contact with eucalyptus. I hope that wasn't a double negative then. So if you read a newspaper, if you use loo roll, kitchen roll, you may have shirts from Marks and Spencers made from tensel. So tensel is like a cell, which is made from eucalyptus fibre. So the tree is used for a lot of things, not just wood and construction, but it's come into the fabric world. The oil is used not only in medicinal products like vapour rub and for inhaling, but the oil is used a lot in Australia for cleaning. It's found in cosmetics. Sometimes, oddly enough, it's found in food, but it's toxic if you drink it. It's a very poisonous thing. So inhaling is great for adults. It's not recommended for children or babies. The oil is also used to make rocket fuel. It can make a, a fuel to use in machinery. The tree itself, the Australians use it for gold prospecting because it will suck up minerals from the soil and it deposits them in its leaves. So if they're looking for gold in Australia, the prospectors will often sample eucalyptus leaves to find out if there is gold deposited in the leaves. And that tells them that it's sitting on top of a seam, which they can then mine. It's used a lot in copier paper as well. So if you're buying copier paper for your printer, very often that's made of eucalyptus wood pulp. It's also very, very good at sequestering carbon out of the atmosphere over and above any other tree. So the rate of carbon assimilation from the atmosphere for eucalyptus is impressive and it stores it in its root system. So, for example, if a farmer is growing eucalyptus as silver pasture where he's got sheep and he's got this plantation of eucalyptus trees and he's growing those for firewood logs or for holes, he's also assimilating carbon out of the atmosphere and storing it in the roots. And even though he takes a crop off the top for his poles or the logs, He's leaving that carbon in the ground and the tree will then regrow off that root system and produce another crop. So he doesn't have to disturb the soil. He doesn't have to replant. So it's very valuable in that respect. Again, it's important to match the eucalyptus species to the growing environment. There's lots of things. I mean, we support a lot of flower farmers with advice on how to grow cut foliage eucalyptus because we're very keen that the British flower farmer should grow local to serve local and not import because eucalyptus is very often grown in Israel and Italy. It gets flown into somewhere like Holland. It gets then sold on the clock and exported to this country. And air miles is not good, but also eucalyptus that's been in a confined environment that's very humid, i.e. cut foliage buckets, the quality is not good. So it's much better to grow it locally and transport it locally and you get very good quality cut foliage. So there's details of that on our website. And we've also written a book to support flower farmers and anybody who wants to grow cut foliage. That was kind of leading into my next question, which is if people did want to find out more about the nursery, yours is obviously going to be an amazing resource. How can people find you? Is there anything else you wanted to point people towards? We do practically everything through the website. It's the hub. We've got a new website going live in two weeks at the beginning of February. And we are improving the content for that as well. All the data sheets are being rewritten because websites started over 10 years ago now. But what we've learned on our journey growing eucalyptus, we have updated our information on the website to support that. So it's um, www.hardy-eucalyptus.com and it has hundreds and hundreds of visits every day from all over the world. And that we get questions from all over the world, people wanting to grow eucalyptus and have various issues with their growing environment and how they can get eucalyptus to grow in their environment. It's quite fascinating. I mean, we speak to people in America. We've got a government-funded research project in Norway. So we, we speak to them. 
We've got growers in New Zealand and Australia that we speak to because the Australians grow it just out in the bush. They don't grow it domestically and for cut foliage. So we speak to them about how they can do what they're doing better. We also support several koala projects in this country because if koala come to the UK, they like to be fed fresh eucalyptus. And they're quite picky about what they want to eat, which is fair enough. So we've got a number of koala projects in the UK where we support them with help and advice on growing eucalyptus to feed the koala. Thank you very much to Hilary for taking us on a dive into the world of eucalyptus. I hope you feel inspired to check out Grafton Nursery and all the varieties on offer there. And thank you to you for listening. Next up is Dr Ian Bedford talking about what happens as your garden is slowly waking up at this time of year. The increasingly longer day lengths of late winter are not only a welcome sign that spring is on its way, but they're the trigger for garden plants that have remained dormant over recent months to start growing again, which in turn triggers the many creatures that rely on these plants for food to start reproducing again, who then become the food of others within the natural food chain of the garden's ecosystem. And as this annual cycle plays out, our gardens become the arenas where their resident species undertake their primary mission in life, which is to reproduce. A task that's driven by unique signals that different species have evolved for their identification and proliferation purposes. Signals such as the visual and audible ones that we'll be accustomed to seeing and hearing in our gardens, but also signals that we invariably can't detect, the chemical signals that allow communication between just those organisms that send them and those that have the means to detect and decipher them. Volatile chemicals that we call pheromones, which, believe it or not, are used more than any other form of signalling within the animal kingdom and are so effective and specific that at molecular levels they allow some species to communicate over many miles. Amazingly though, thanks to modern day science, we now know that it's not just animals that use pheromones for communication, but certain plants do too, and that these plants use them primarily for their defence such as certain brassicas that release chemical signals to attract parasitic wasps that then attack cabbage white butterfly caterpillars that are eating their leaves. Or the plants that release chemical signals to warn neighbouring plants that they're being eaten by a herbivore, allowing their neighbours time to begin defending themselves. And this is demonstrated by pine trees when they're attacked by mountain pine beetles. Because when the beetles tunnel into their bark, the tree emits a pheromone that signals a warning to the neighbouring trees, who then begin producing a lot more sticky sap that deters beetles from tunnelling into their own bark. However, the release of volatile chemicals is not always beneficial to plants, since they'll also be used by certain herbivores to detect and home in on a plant. And this is certainly the case with those monophagous herbivores, such as the pea, rose and cabbage aphids, who, as their name suggests, have a very specific association with a particular plant type that their survival will totally depend on. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All Podcast.